Uh, all right, guys, so let's get started on this thing. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome you to the broadcast again. This is End Time Headlines slash Remnant Revival Ministries. And uh, today I want to uh, be dealing with a special segment, uh, a particular topic that I uh, want to discuss today. And this is why I brought on our special guest, which I'm going to have him announce. Uh, I'm going to have him share a little bit about himself here as well. But if you would, again, guys, please go ahead and share this, tag some folks in this, invite some folks, uh, maybe share it to your group page or whatever the case may be. I believe people will be blessed by this. So without further ado, uh, I want to be respectful of your time, guys. Uh, I want to welcome you to the broadcast. I want to welcome Ryan Johnson. Um, that's the guy that you see up there at the top. I know we don't do a lot of these uh, dual broadcasts a lot, but we need to do this more often. Uh, it's fun, and it's really uh, equipping to the body. So, Ryan, let, uh, let everybody know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, and uh, what your heart is, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Well, I'm born and raised out of northeast Alabama, um, a place called Sand Mountain, but we, we live in the valley here in Fort Payne, Alabama, and uh, it's a place we've called home for the majority of our life, but uh, we have lived in a couple of different places, one near Washington, D.C., one in North Carolina, one in Birmingham, Alabama. But uh, my wife and I uh, have been here for the past three years, been married for 22 years, got four children, two girls, two boys, and been involved in ministry and serving the Lord for 21 years now, November 30th, March. 21 years. So we're just climbing and digging and constantly breaking the ground and trying to do everything we can to advance the kingdom Praise of God. God man. That's awesome. So uh, I don't know if you heard that. Hopefully everybody can hear clearly. Uh, but Ryan is in Alabama. This is the state that you guys just got hit with that tornado outbreak. I don't know how close that was in proximity where you live. Uh, but they said, what was the death toll now? 23 or something like that? It was. It was 23. It was three hours south of us. It was in uh, near Auburn, Opelika, Alabama, in a little town called Beauregard. And 23, they officially called off all searches yesterday and confirmed fatalities being at 23. And now we're looking at a second round of storms coming in this Saturday that uh, is affecting more than just Alabama this time as it's got a broader range. So it's this part of the country and it's part of this time of the year. Uh, it's something I don't like, but when you're here, you have to endure right. it. Yep, exactly. I was, I was about to say that too. You beat me to it, that there is another round coming this Saturday. But, but guys, listen, uh, I've known Ryan for several years. Um, and one thing I love about Ryan, he's, he, he, you get what you see. He's the real deal uh, on and off the camera. I know him outside of uh, when he's, you know, ministering behind the pulpit or he's ministering on social media or whatever the case may be. Um, he's solid. Uh, his character is there. And that's why, you know, I really, if there's anybody that can, that can really expound on the particular topic that we're talking about today that I can trust that I know, uh, that's Ryan. So today we're going to be dealing with prophetic ethics. Now, Ryan and I discussed this um, uh, in private, what we were going to talk about, obviously, so I want him to expand a little bit on when we talk about prophetic ethics, uh, Ryan, what, I, I'm going to let you loose, man. What I'm going to do today, I just want to host this thing. I'm going to let you out of the gate, and, and I may interject here and there, but I'm going to predominantly let you just loose on this thing. When we talk about prophetic ethics, uh, let me ask you a question. What does that mean, A, and B, why is this important today? Well, we have to understand that in modern Christianity, there is a struggle in what is authentic and what is fake or false. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when you read the scripture that says there'll be a time in which man will be entertained and their ears will be tickled and they'll be swayed by the winds of doctrine, you think, gosh, there can never be a time such as that. But now when you look at it, I remember thinking back, you know, 15 years ago, it can't get any more ridiculous than this. And yet it is getting a lot more ridiculous than this. The tickling of ears, especially in an apostolic or prophetic format, is mind boggling to me. It's amazing how people are falling for so much. So when we talk about prophetic ethics, we're talking about 
the authenticity of God's word being truth in the function of a prophetic ministry, whether that is a prophet, whether that is operating the gifts of prophetic ministry. You know, where is the honor? Where is the integ integrity? And where is the character of an individual when it comes to the things in which we're saying and in the things in which we're doing in ministry? Everything is not necessarily prophetic, but we try to make everything prophetic for a hashtag or a like or a share on social media. And there's just a lot of things that are going on that are culturally relevant and they're being accepted by the culture, but it's not necessarily according to the standard of the righteousness of Christ. We have to judge things according to the word of God. And what's happening in modern Christianity is a farce a lot of times because you got things that, that these one word catchisms that are happening all the time. You know, there, there's there's something that will be uh, an exciting hashtag and people will share it, they'll like it, they'll click it, and but there's no substance to it. And, and, and there's things that are just being thrown out there. And I'm looking back and going, okay, where's the righteousness of Christ in this? Where is this at as an apostolic minister? You know, if, if you're professing to be an apostle, if you're professing to be an, a, a, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, when I'm saying apostolic ministry, I'm talking about fivefold across the board. Okay, so I'm talking about fivefold ministry. I'm talking about acts and forward. Okay, but where's the accountability at? Where is the integrity of uh, the righteousness of Christ in us? You know, we we when we say holiness and righteousness, there's always going to be a group of people that's going to say you're legalistic or you're Old Testament. Yet in the New Testament, it is profound that we are required to live a life of holiness because God himself is holy. And we are required to have the righteousness of Christ. But these things that are being thrown out there are so unethical according to the word of God, but they, they, they're, they're so minute in their substance that they can't be corrected or held standard to the word of God. There's this room of error that's being put out there with a lot of prophetic ministries. It's disheartening. It's sad. It's uh, it's heartbreaking and it's frustrating and all those things. But what is amazing to me is when people begin to discern through Holy Spirit, it's amazing the group of individuals that start screaming, you're being judgmental. Discernment is the new word of judgmental in the kingdom of God here, in, in especially in modern America. But there is a lot of this going on in nations across the earth. Naturally, I don't want to discredit that. But especially here in America, if you say anything, you're being judgmental. Now, I, I want to clarify something very, very important here. Because when we talk about prophetic ethics, we need to understand the difference between a judgment and judgmental. Because the Bible is clear that we are supposed to judge words. We're supposed to judge the actions and the mannerisms, the integrity of those who are sons and daughters of God. Now, I'm not saying that you're to be judgmental towards one another, but I'm saying you are called to judge your brothers and sisters in Christ according to the fruit and which they are identifying with. For example, if I have a brother in Christ who's committing adultery, and I go to him and I say, you cannot be doing this. You can't be sick. You can't. Adultery is a sin unto you and unto what you're doing to yourself. That person may look at me and say, you're judging me. My response is, that's right. I am. According to the word of God, we are called to hold one another accountable to the righteousness of Christ. Now, that does not give me the right to be judgmental. But it gives me the right to judge those who have a relationship with Christ. Now, let me, let me clarify. We are not called to judge those without Christ. Those who have no relationship with Jesus, we are not called to judge them. The sinner who has no knowledge of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, who has no relationship with Jesus as Savior, we are not permitted to judge them. We're not, we're not permitted to because they can't be held accountable to the righteousness of Christ because they ha do not have a relationship with the Father through the Son. However, everybody that says, judge not lest you be judged, go back and finish that chapter. Everybody that says, 
Well, you got to deal with the plank in your own eye before the speck in your brother's eye. Finish that verse. That verse says, after you deal with that plank in your eye, you still have to go to your brother and help him with the speck in his eye. So here's the thing. When we talk about prophetic ethics, we're talking about holding us accountable according to the word of God. Is this correct? Is this right? Is this what God would say? Is this the nature of the Father? You know, I, I saw something, and I'm not discrediting the person. I'm not, I'm not bashing them so nobody think anything. I'm simply judging the word, okay? But when 2019 came out, there was a – and I don't even remember who said this, but I saw it through a lot of um, reshares of social media. And it said 2019, the year of the answer. Now, everybody's sharing it. Yes, 2019, the year of the answer, the answer, the answer. Now, in and of itself, there's nothing really wrong with that because there's nothing really there. But I kind of laughed to myself, and I got tickled, and I thought, well, I guess this means Allen Iverson is coming back because Allen Iverson used to be an NBA player, and his nickname was The Answer. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, I can make that word be whatever I need it to be, and this is the problem. The, the answer could be wrong Come for on. your life, but because it was an answer, you therefore automatically say it was God. It opens up the door for so many avenues. You know, when you read a lot of these prophetic words today, I'm perplexed. I'm, 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 I'm baffled a lot of times because I'm like, has God lost the ability to speak in sentences uh -huh. anymore? Because, you know, when you read the Bible and God spoke to the prophets – and spoke to man, he spoke in sentences and often paragraphs, and he spoke it directly with a purpose. And it cracks me up because I read one of these one-word catchisms, and I'm like, it's like God's lost the ability to speak to man anymore. And then when you connect all the one-word catchisms, it's like, what is he even saying? You know, and it, it, it's sad that we speak these words and we make these words to be whatever we need them to be to fit our situation. It's why in the body of Christ, I'm convinced uh, that we have leaders in the body of Christ that are reckless. Now, not all, not all leaders are. We have some phenomenal leaders in the body of Christ, but some of them have been married for 20 plus years and all of a sudden they leave their spouse for another man's wife. And then they say, oh, grace and mercy. God said, I deserve to be happy. Or God said, I, I deserve this and, and so on and so forth. And, and you're going, what in the world? But, you know, if you're, if you're a pastor and you spot another man's wife you want, you could look and say, listen, God said she's the answer. Right. And 2019 is the year of the answer. <laughs> so the ethics of it is, we have to get back to what the word is actually saying and the definitive of who the father is in his nature, his character, his holiness, and his righteousness. Anything outside of those realms or outside of the box. Now, I get it, man. You, you've dealt with it. You're going to have these people that says, oh, I'm at such this, this um, persona. Or I'm at this such revelation or I'm at this level that – God is talking to me in levels that you don't understand, and I have these fresh revelations. Look, there are going to be new revelations to you and I. That is without a shadow of a doubt. There's going to come new revelations to you and I, things that we never saw before. However, those new revelations will never, ever, at any time, contradict the written word of God. And at any time, those new revelations are never new to heaven. They're always revealed to heaven, but they're, they're only new to us as, as, as individuals. But if in our new revelations, in our new advancements, in our new levels, whatever you want to call it, we have to understand that if it goes against the word of God, it is wrong, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. You can put new on it every single day. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't the purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, man, I, I, I agree 100%. And I, I just want to interject a couple things that I want to kind of run by you and see and, and get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, the problem is, uh, and, and again, I, you know, I, I hesitate to say this, but we have some publications that 
uh, you know, you can sign up and you can get an email and you can get a prophetic word every single day you wake up. And like you said, the problem with this, there's such a generality of these words that I wouldn't even term them to be prophetic words as they are. And, and let me say this. A lot of these words are quote unquote prophetic words and they're not even bad per se. They're not even evil in essence, but they are not, um, they're not so much prophetic as they are exhorting. You know, when if I stand up and give a word of yes. exhortation, you know, it's a, I, I, personally, I don't believe that true prophecy is a one size fits all. It's just not, man. Because, like, it, I can give a prophetic word now and say, uh, you know, the Lord says go, but let's just be honest here. For some of us, it's not go, it's stay. And for some of us, it's not stay, it's go. So you cannot take, you know, a prophecy and make it fit to your accommodation or your circumstances based on just because it sounds good, looks good, or because it was on some publication. So, you know, everybody's hoo ha and about this, you know, prophetic word. Um, so that, I, I believe that's caused a lot of error. And I see, you know, I, I believe you agree with that. And that's kind of what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, another thing is, if we were to be honest here, I love social media. Obviously, we're using social media today as a platform, uh, you know, to, to be able to reach people through the media mountain. Because uh, not everybody watches Christian television. Not everybody, you know, can attend a conference or attend a meeting or whatever the case may be. So we use this these methods and methodologies to reach people. But one of the negatives, as there's always going to be positives, there's going to be negatives. One of the negatives I've seen uh, dealing with social media and is it breeds it has it is breeded uh, rogue, what I call rogue prophets and what I mean by that is uh, come on everybody I mean we used to be on Periscope I used to be on Periscope and man I came off Periscope because I, you know, I was looking for all the <laughs> prophets today and I couldn't find them and I found out they weren't hiding in Obadiah's cave they were on Periscope and Everybody was apostle, an apostle or a prophet. And what I'm saying is, when I talk about rogue prophets, is when we get to the root of this, there's no accountability. They're not, they're not rooted in the church. They're not, um, they're not accountable to anyone. They don't have a group of guys that keep them in line, you know, and so on and so forth. So therefore, and when you begin to talk to them, I, I think Jeremiah Johnson talked about this the other day. He did a really good piece about this, and he really nailed this. And he, when you get to talk about these individuals and you get to know them, you'll discover that many of these, and I've even questioned some of them and asked them, who's your covering? And they'll say, Jesus. Jesus is my covering. Because they don't yeah. want to be um, they don't want to be held to the confines or accountability to, to a pastor, a leader, an apostle, or a church, or a group of guys. Uh, that hold them accountable. Um, if you got anything on any of this, man, go ahead and interject. I'm just throwing some stuff out here that I kind of took notes on. Go ahead. Well, let, let me. I, I do two things. One, it, it is amazing. You're you're 100 right. A lot of people say, "Well, Jesus or God is my 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 response." And I often hear people say, "It's because no one gets me. No one understands me." Now, listen, I I can. I can potentially understand that to a degree. And there are people that are peculiar and it takes a special person to understand peculiar people. Um, so I'm not going to discredit it wholeheartedly. However, I think that's become a cop out. You know, people don't, it's a cop out to accountability when you're held accountable and a leader or a mentor or spiritual father, mother, says, listen, you can't do that. A lot of people rise up in anger and they rise up. Who are you to stop me? I heard the word of the Lord and they don't want to follow the order in which God has put into place. And so a lot of people, they buck it and they, they leave and then they say, you know, no one understands me. Listen, I really don't buy that a whole lot because you've got to be able to find somewhere that somebody wow. understands you. Somebody can help you. You, you know, what gripes me about modern apostolic ministry, and I'm going to say something that's probably going to make some people mad, but just love me anyway, and, and you'll have a good day for the rest of the day anyhow. What drives me nuts about apostolic ministry in a lot of cases is the uh, anger 
and the bitterness towards the local church. You cannot convince me. You cannot convince me that you are fully apostolic ministry and you are anti-local church. I'm sorry. Every local church is not wrong. Every local church is not doing it wrong. Every local church does not have a dictator uh, or some um, mean-spirited leader. Are there problems? Yes. I'm, I'm not... I'm not denying that whatsoever, but it doesn't mean that the local church has been wrong from the get-go, and therefore every one of them has to be done away with. There are apostolic functioning local churches that are doing phenomenal jobs. You just got to find them. That's the thing. You can't be anti-local church because people don't understand you. They don't get you. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that probably didn't get Simon Peter, but Jesus did. And Jesus eventually put him in an environment with other people that may not fully got him, but learned how to um, learn how to go um, uh, uh, um, um, hand in hand and work with Simon Peter. You know, Simon Peter and, and, and John, John the Beloved, are polar opposites when you look at their personalities yet they were able to coincide with one another. I mean, we could actually look and say, man, th- th- that could even be a type and shadow of how we should be functioning, uh, even though they're polar opposites of that. And that's just a small piece. The other side of it is when you mention these words that we get, uh, you brought that up about the emails and stuff, and you, you nailed it right there when you said a lot of these are exhorting words. They're words of encouragement. They're words that lift you up. And we call them prophetic words because – It flows in the gift of prophecy. Now, here's what I want to say wholeheartedly to everybody that's listening. There is a definitive line between the gift of prophecy and a prophet. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we have been so drawn and hungry for the gift of prophecy. We're a generation that loves the edification, exhortation, and comfort because we're a generation that has a lot of issues. I mean, let's just face it. So any words of encouragement, any words of lifting us up in our spirit, any positive thing, it is like, um, you know, uh, the greatest high that we can possibly get spiritually because it lifts us up. So we just are drawn to the gifts of, of prophecy. And the moment a prophet, an authentic prophet comes into a region and shares a word that must bring about correction or must bring about um, the, the uh, repentance that is needed. We're so drawn to the gifting that we reject the prophet because it immediately doesn't sound edified. It doesn't sound encouraging. Now, there's the duality of this. There are rogue, like you said, rogue prophets who are so bitter at everyone and everything that when they bring words that have repentance or correction, they bring it with a wrong spirit behind it. It's laced with bitterness and anger and hatred, and, and it's wrong on every sense of the level. Now, the reason I say that is because prophets, even though they must be corrective, even though they have words that are repentive, even though they have words that are sometimes destroying a certain structure, uh, even though those words are difficult and challenging, an authentic prophet, will always have in their word a plan of hope, restoration, redemption, and reconciliation. They will always carry the heart of the Father. And if you read the word of God and everything that God ever had to do throughout mankind and all the times that man made God angry and frustrated and all these bad things happen and these words happen, God always had a plan of hope. So you got these rogue prophets. They're mad at everybody in the world, so they say these things. Now, because we want the gift so much, the minute somebody said something wrong, we automatically labeled them not prophetic or we labeled them false because we're so hungry for the gifts. We, unfortunately, in a lot of circles, we don't know how to separate the gifts from the identity because we're, we, 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 we're so starved for that. What's the result of that? Unfortunately, there is now an emerging group of quote-unquote prophets 
who I call candy cotton profits. They're candy cotton profits. They give you sugar because it's sweet and it's a bunch of hot air. There's no substance to it. And we fill up on their words. We fill up on the sugar and the hot air. And it fills us up temporarily, but it doesn't sustain us because it's just sugar-laced words with hot air. And it, it, it's interesting because those are the things that are getting shared in light today, whereas what is truth is not often being shared in that. So I, I just want to jump in on those two things there. So yeah, keep going, well, man. Everything you said, man, is really, it kind of hinges off. Uh, there was an article that was posted on Charisma by Jay Lee Brady. Uh, and we shared this on Eight Time Headlines. It was called, Why Are We Afraid to Preach About Sin? And he nails every single point you're talking about. And what, and what I want to emphasize here is on the flip side of the coin, the, uh, the pressure of the, the pressure that comes on true prophetic ministry from this culture that we're in is what I believe is pressuring them to begin to be, uh, they're grouping themselves to be like, what we're seeing is, is a parallel of the 450 prophets of Baal. When you go to, when you go into the story of, you know, first and second Kings, it talks about, there was these groups and you, most of you guys know this, but there was a, uh, there was a, a league of prophets that they they were eating at the table of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, their all their message all sounded the same. Uh, it had one particular purpose, and it never went against the grain. Remember the story of Micaiah. Micaiah was the true prophet, but they kept him in the dark. They kept him locked away. They kept him suppressed um, because his message was deemed negative. And even when they were bringing him up. When they were bringing him up to prophesy, I uh, remember one of the men told him, said, look, when you get up here, uh, we need you to sound like everybody else. Because if as long as you, if you sound like everybody else and you prophesy like everybody else and your message resonates like everybody else, it'll be good for you. We'll let you out of the dungeon. We'll let you out of the dark. You can begin to eat with us. You can begin to socialize with us. You can begin to run with us and you can be like us. But I mean, you guys know the story. He got up there. And he was more concerned uh, with, the, you know, with with pleasing God than he was being popular. Um, and this is the scary part of this. I mean, and you, when you look across the board, we see this everywhere. Um, and I mean, I believe we have an epidemic of this. So, and, and, and it's and the proof is in the pudding because when a true prophet comes forth, and you nailed it, man, because I took a note right here. And as I was writing it, you were speaking it. A, a true prophetic word will always have a redemptive hope in it. Uh, it will bring, it will expose the problem, but it will also bring the resolution and bring the resolve. Okay. Uh, it's the two edged sword, I believe, of a true prophetic word. Um, so the, the scary part about this is, again, like I said, the proof is in the pudding that we're in this, in this era right now, or in this, uh, in this, in this, the face of modern Christianity, what we're dealing with is because here's the proof guys is when a true prophet comes forth and he begins to say, thus saith the Lord. And it's and it may not be a fluff. It may not be a sugary message. It may not be a pat you on the back and send you home and make you feel good about yourself. It may be a word of correction. It may be something to uproot, to pluck up, to tear down, and to bring down or to destroy that needs to be. Look at, I mean, come on, look what what, what Hezekiah had to do. Look at what other these other individuals that came forth to try to bring, you know, correction in the in in the church per se. Um, in, in the body of Christ or in that time in Israel in the Old Testament, when they came forth with a negative word, they were deemed or marked as a false prophet. Um, and I'm sorry, guys, that's just not the case. Um, and sadly, we, we esteem someone uh, that we esteem someone to have a weighty word based on the reaction of people. If they're shouting and hooting and hollering, slapping people with towels and talits and sweat and flying everywhere, and people throwing off their shoes and running around the building, well, he's, he, you know, that was a real prophet of God. But that's not always the case. 
<laughs> and you and you and you know that to be true. Um, uh, so it's so I guess let, let's let's put this into practice. How do we we see the problem? We see what's going on. So how do we resolve this? How are we going to how are we going to bring reformation to the true apostolic prophetic message in this hour? Well, first of all, we need to get back to the Word of God, and we need to be definitive on what the identity of a prophet is versus the gift of prophecy. You may flow in the gift of prophecy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are a prophet. However, if you are a prophet, you must be able to flow in the gift of prophecy as well, which is why you're going to have the uh, ability to have the redemption. You're going to have in those words. You know, one of those things... Uh, that I say about prophets, prophets are destructive, constructive, and instructive. And what I mean by that is there are times that prophets are going to be sent to a region, uh, sent to a ministry, whatever, and there must be something that must be torn down. So there's the destruction. But a true, a true prophet who carries the heart of the Father is going to take the time to build back up. That's the constructive side of a prophet. Now, where a lot of prophets are missing Yes, we got a lot that are simply destructive, and they don't take the time to build back up. However, I go a step further. They need to be instructive. If you go back to the Word of God, one of the identities of a prophet is they were teachers of the Word. Teachers of the Word. So you can be destructive and constructive, but if you don't become instructive and teach those individuals where they're at, and how they got to this point, they're just going to repeat the cycle yeah, all right. over again. That's, that's what's going to happen. So we got to have prophets who are willing. Listen, I get excited. There's times when I minister. I get, I get loud. I get, you know, I may get a little fast in my speech, and I sweat. <laughs> and I will hoop and holler with the best of them, sure. But I've been working so diligently to make myself – Teach the written word of God. Instruct the word. So there's times that I'm taking a step back and not trying to get the rousing crowd and the applause and the amen to simply teach the word of God. So how do we fix it? Number one, get back to the word. Get back to the word. If you're quoting, listen, I love, um, I love where we're at in um, the sense that we have more Bibles that we could ever get our hands on in, in this nation. Uh, there's computer software. There's social media avenues. I love the fact that we have, a, you know, all these different uh, ministries that are sending out email lists and all this stuff. It's great. It's wonderful. But if we don't get back to the Word of God and, and look at those words and put it into the application of the Word of God, then we're putting more value on what man has said versus what God has already declared. What we have to make sure is when man says something, does their declaration go in, co uh, in, in, in correspondence with the word of God? Does it collaborate with the word? Because I can give you sweet, sugary words under the pressure, pressure of the culture, and I can become famous. Listen, listen. There are so many people that have told me in times, I, if you'll do this, you can grow your ministry. If you'll do this, you'll have more followers. If you'll do this, man, I can get you on this speaking platform, and I can get you on this. And if you'll do this, you'll have more monthly partners and people so in your ministry. And, you know, when you first see it, you're like, wow, I mean, I could have this and I could have that and everything. But it's here. It, 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 it's 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 the the heart of the father beating in you going okay do i do i walk away from who god has created anointed and called me to be for a moment's fleeting of popularity and fame do i surrender all this because of uh the the idea of uh, i want to be famous or do i stand for the righteousness of christ in this so we fix it by getting to the Word of God. We fix it by holding accountable to that Word. Holding accountable to that Word. The, the Scripture clearly says that prophets are subject to prophets. It also says in 1 Corinthians 14 that when a prophet speaks a word, 
That word is to be judged. That word is supposed to be judged according to the righteousness of what it is, according to what it is that they're saying in reliance to the word of God. The problem is, and, and I'm, not, I'm not griping about it, so I know my heart when I say it. The, the, one of the problems that we've got in, in modern Christianity is there is a minimum of eight words coming out every single oh, yeah. day. Uh, if not more, you know, there, yeah, it, it, there's so many in abundance that are coming out every single day. You, you couldn't have a full-time employee to keep up with and mark and check every single one of these words. I mean, it is just an overflow of words. So well, I'm getting to my third point and saying, I don't have the answer yet in the sense of how do we corral these words and hold them in accountability. Now, I don't know in the broad s spectrum, but I know in a uh, local setting, when you have people that are a prophetic ministry, prophetic house, you need to have uh, open conversations and dialogue to what is happening under your leadership and with your leadership support, what's happening in the body of Christ, uh, prophetically speaking. You can't just let every single word be, quote unquote, the word of the Lord because it came on a certain platform. Discernment is going to be key in this. You've got to have Holy Spirit discernment working in you to be able to understand that when that little red flag goes off and you go, something about this is not right, you need to have open dialogue with someone else that you can, you can communicate with and be able to share, am I, am I missing it? Am I missing this? Am I not, you know, you, you don't need to be a random person uh, in your ministry, in your church, just kind of going free willy on this. You need to have leadership support. You need to have that because it's accountability at the end of the day. Accountability, accountability, accountability. Uh, I, I will not bend on accountability. So I, I don't have the exact answer on how we turn it because I don't know how we deal with the influx of these words. I, I don't know how we, we overcome it, you know. Um, it, it's so much at, at such one time. My mind tells me I think we have to start locally. We got to start kind of dissecting these words. And, and we got we got to start speaking because I, I, I think a lot of times people are catching on but they're afraid to say anything because if they say anything, they're going to be more judgmental instead of, Oh, that's discernment. I, I think they just, they sit back and they, and they go quiet and they don't want to say anything. So, you know, it's gotta be in some form of accountability, but it's the only way that I'm seeing that we overcome this because it is such a massive problem right now. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, gosh, how many new words did we get from 2019 and how many words are different now? You know, and I'm not, please, please, everybody watching, know my heart when I say this. I'm not saying that God is never going to say that March is coming in marching like an army or marching like, you know, whatever. But it, it, in some ways, it's kind of comical because we hear that every March, every single March we hear that. Uh, in April, we're going to hear words about, uh, you know, the raining down of God's glory. We're going to, you know, God's raining down. God's doing this. Why? Because April showers. In May, we're going to hear words about, you know, God is blooming. God is bursting oh, forth, you know, and it's going to be because May flowers. You know, in 2020, we're going to get a thousand words that this is the year of oh, clear God. and perfect vision. You know, we're even going to get words about hindsight. 2020. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying that God would never say anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying some of these or the, are. Or the, how about or the Super Bowl ones? Every time Super Bowl or the NBA championship, somebody's got to give a prophetic word on a particular team. And this was of the Lord. And this is a sign from God. Only after that team wins. <laughs> right. Right. It's kind of like the hurricanes form in the ocean, 
then they can figure out where they're going. And all of a sudden, everybody's a prophet about this particular state once they found out about the hurricane being formed. <laughs> right, right. So, but do you have anything else? If not, we're going to, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to do it. Okay. Go ahead. Let's talk about, uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about this. Uh, what, what must we learn from sonship through the father and not just a father? Uh, do, do you want to, what do you want to elaborate on that just a little bit? And maybe I'll interject some stuff here too, probably. Um, you know, there's a, there's still a constant b debate going on in, in, in a lot of churches. A lot of people, um, you know, when they get to the scripture where Jesus says, call no man mother, call no man father, our brother or sister, it, it, there's a lot of times that a lot of people will use that and they'll say, um, you know, we shouldn't um, have spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers because of that passage of scripture. Now, uh, I believe the abuse of spiritual mothers and fathers definitely uh, collaborate with that passage of scripture. But I believe what that passage of scripture ultimately is talking about is that you should never mark anyone greater than the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. You shouldn't mark someone to be more influential in your life than mankind. And that's the reason you get these different levels of mother, father, brother, sister, and all this stuff. Uh, it's ultimately why Jesus also said when he was asked about his mother, he said, I have no mother. I know, you know, I have no brother or sister in it. And he just, you know, quote unquote, disowned them. Now, he wasn't denying the reality that he didn't have a mother, which was Mary. He was denying that no one came before the father. Uh, that's what he was, he was denying them. He was saying that in that application. So what's happening, though, is we, we have this longing to connect with a spiritual father or spiritual mother. And uh, I'm, I'm not anti-spiritual father and spiritual mother. I'm actually for it. But let me say that I'm how I'm for it. I don't believe that you should see someone and just automatically want to connect with them and make them a spiritual father or spiritual mother in your life because of what you see about that person's life. In other words, they're on a platform, they're leading a good congregation, and you think, wow, I want to be a part of that. That's, I am not for that whatsoever. Matter of fact, my own personal protocol is you should have someone to be a mentor over your life for a number of years. And if that mentor and your relationship over a period of time transforms into more of a spiritual father and a spiritual son, then that's what it is. But you don't, I, I'm not a big fan of seeking out spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. I'm a fan of being mentored. Uh, seek a mentor in your life that can speak into your life. One of the things that is happening is because we speak of mantles so often in this day and time, everybody's wanting a spiritual father that they can get their mantle. Now, <laughs> I, 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 I've kind of got a little bit of a hang up with mantles here. Now, let, let me explain. I believe in mantles. Let me first say that. But I believe mantles can only be passed from that person to whoever they want that next person to have it. In other words, for example, um, you know, it is often told and, and believed that Leonard Ravenhill, the mantle in which he had in ministry, he passed it on to Steve Hill. Steve Hill had a relationship with that's Leonard right. Ravenhill. Right. And I believe that's the way mantles <laughs> should be passed. Now, everybody's going to run to the scripture of Elisha and Elisha's in the tomb and everything. And, and, and I get that because that was active in that. But here's my problem. Um, I, I believe a lot of people are misquoting. For, for example, a lot of people are saying, you're going to get Billy Graham's mantle. Billy Graham's mantle is being passed out. Billy Graham's mantle is being passed out. I personally believe that's impossible. I, I'm saying that to say all this because a lot of people may want to, if Billy Graham was still alive, they would say, oh, I want Billy Graham to be my spiritual father in hopes to potentially get his mantle. But Billy Graham could have passed his mantle on to his son or to someone else, and we just don't know it in, in that moment. 
but I can't just go and get Billy Graham's mantle. I believe a lot of people are, are thinking that in error, but I think a lot of times too people are misspeaking. I believe what they're misidentifying is evangelism. You can have an impartation evangelism from the throne room of God. God can impart into you a spirit of evangelism um, that will uh, ignite and, and mature and develop over time. And that gifting can rise up into you and you mature for that. But you're not getting Billy Graham's mantle. So what's happening is a lot of these people are, are connecting with these quote unquote spiritual fathers and, oh, I'm his son, I'm his daughter. And, and I walk underneath their covering and I walk underneath their mantle and I walk under that and they're imparting this. Listen, I don't even think I can impart anything into you unless you and I have a relationship. I can only impart into you what is of the kingdom of heaven. But what is of me, you and I got to have a relationship if there's going to be any kind of impartation. I can't impart anything to you and you be a stranger to me and I a stranger to you. That's ridiculous. But I love, I, I, I won't say his name, but a, a pretty well-known uh, minister um, invited a friend of mine to uh, their house. I loved what this minister said. And so he goes up to the house. This is well-known, you know, got television programs, all this stuff, everything. And this minister looks at my friend, and the first words out of his mouth is, you can't have my mantle. And it kind of stunned my friend. And the, the guy goes, however, if you will allow me to develop you, I can help you grow your own. Right. And it was like a boom moment because here's a guy who, who would one day become a spiritual father to somebody, but he was trying to get them to understand something about what spiritual fathers should be. So let's the difference between sonship and just sons of man. Everybody's chasing sons of man. I have a spiritual father in my life. I didn't chase them. They, they became a mentor to me before anything. They were a mentor for me for a couple years before they became anything else. Um, but what, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is you have those that identify being a son of man more than being a son of God. You have people that are more fascinated with I'm so-and-so spiritual son or so-and-so spiritual daughter than they do recognizing that they are a son of God. You know, it's fascinating. I heard um, a gentleman uh, share this in a meeting. It was, a, it was a, um, just a, you know, sitting in the living room. And I thought this was one of the most fascinating things I ever heard in my life. Um, and he said, if you take the writings of, of the Apostle Paul, and you put them in chronological order. And I looked this up to kind of verify this. And um, I was fascinated by it. He said, when you look at Apostle Paul's life, the first letter he writes, he addresses himself, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he would address himself, you know, later as an apostle. Okay, so when you chronologically look at the order, when he first writes his letter, he addresses himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ or the apostle of Jesus Christ. But as time went on, his introduction began to change. And as time goes on, Apostle Paul wasn't just an Apostle Paul. And then he became a messenger, a servant. And then he became just the son of God. And he recognized, it's, it's fascinating because I never knew this until you go back and research this. You look at this chronologically. As great as it was that he recognized that he was an apostle, he recognized that his greatest identity was in being a son. And this is where we're missing it in this generation because I'm so-and-so spiritual son. I'm so-and-so spiritual son. Well, lot of freaking da. You know, are you a son of God? Where's your sonship at? Because at the end of the day, when you and I face God in eternity, it will not be as an apostle. It won't be as a prophet, a teacher, a pastor, evangelist, deacon, elder. It won't even be as a husband, a wife. It won't be as... Uh, an aunt, an uncle, a grandfather, or a grandmother. But it will be whether or not you are a son. And we got to get back to the sonship. I'm not discrediting the titles of five-fold ministry. I'm not discrediting that you're a pastor, teacher, pastor, prophet, 
whatever. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a spiritual father. I'm all for them when they're right. But because of this and this mantle chasing and this impartation that is going on, we've created a conundrum of spiritual fathers who are rotating sons and daughters like they're Pokemon cards. You know, I heard a guy uh, not long ago, I heard a, a, a pretty well-known guy, and he was talking about someone that I knew, and he goes, I saw a spirit of sonship all over this guy, and he became a spiritual son of mine. And I got tickled. And I got tickled because <clears throat> in the past two years of knowing this individual, he had already been through five spiritual fathers. Mm -hmm. One day, and when I first met him, this guy was his spiritual father. Then he left him for this guy, and then he left him for this guy, and this guy, and this guy. Now he's this guy's spiritual father. And it's just gotten so out of hand because we don't know how to be true sons. Now, the problem it's created is we don't have true fathers. We don't have true daughters. When my earthly father raised me, when he, he was raising me up as a son, my father did not raise me to be a uh, replacement to him. He didn't, he didn't raise me to replace him. He raised me as a son to one day become a father, not to be his replacement. So if I'm going into a relationship, let's just say, Ricky, I'm coming into your life, and I'm saying you're going to be my spiritual father, but my goal is to one day replace you, then that's error on my part. But it's also error on your part if you permit that ideology to go on and to continue. Now we have spiritual fathers that are telling people that if you don't, um, if you don't do this and you don't do that, you're a rebellious son or daughter. Rebellious son and daughter according to what? Rebellious son and daughter according to the way you do ministry or according to the way that it's written in the Word of God? Because are there rebellious sons? Yes. According to the word of God, if they if if you've got a spiritual son that is living a life of homosexuality while they're uh, professing to be you know right with God, then yes, that is a sign of rebellion. But if you've got somebody that you're having a disagreement with, and you call them rebellious because you're disagreeing with them, what kind of father are you? You know, it it is the, there's a serious abandonment that's going on in the church right now, and I'm looking back and going, that's not the father, that's not the father at all. I can't find where where God acted this way. Yet we're supposed to be spiritual fathers. How how are we just forsaking them and throwing them to the side? I thought we were supposed to be those that fought for our, our sons and daughters. I thought we were supposed to be the generation of fathers that never took their eyes off the road. Even if a son does leave in rebellion, I'm constantly looking down the road. Come on, come on. And when you come back, come on, I'm going to be ready. I'm not going to alienate you and blackball you and blacklist you and all this stuff because it's not the heart of the father. But we're raising this generation and that we got fathers that are abandoning these sons and daughters left and right because of this concept of, you don't, you don't want what I have to offer you. I, I thought we were supposed to be offering Christ. I thought we were supposed to be offering the Father. Right. You know, I love what, uh, you know, a friend of both of us, uh, Jason Armstrong put, where Paul talks about, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If I see more of you as a man than I see of Christ, then what are we really doing as fathers? That's good, man. That's good. Um, and some of the stuff I want to interject real quick. You talked about relationship. Uh, Paul, he referred to Timothy as his son. And we know he had a relationship with him. And we can prove this through Scripture because Paul recognized he had such a bond and a relationship and intimacy with Timothy that even in his own letters, he acknowledged the faith that Timothy had and said, I see the same faith. The, not only that you possess, but I see it in your lineage. I see it in your mother and your grand grandmother. Now stop for a second. Not only did Paul have a relationship with Timothy, but he also, this tells me that Paul 
knew beyond Timothy, but he also had an, an acknowledgement of his family. Now, I'm going to really plow on that in just a second. And another thing is Paul said that you have many teachers. You have an abundance of teachers. And my God, do we ever today have an abundance of teachers? You can get seminars. You can get webinars. You can get books. You can get eBooks. You can get this. You can get, I mean, we have an abundance of teaching. But he says you have an abundance or you have many teachers, but you have not many fathers. And when, when he says fathers here, let's go back to what you were just talking about. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So if Paul is a father to Timothy and he's setting an example as a father, then when he says you have not many teachers, but you have, or you have many teachers, but you have not many fathers, what are we basing the attributes and the characteristics of? Well, we have to go back to the life of Paul, the apostle. Now, this is the same guy who wrote to the church of Corinth. Corinth. Now, the hyper-grace movement will use the Apostle Paul as their poster child um, that never got angry, never rebuked anybody, never corrected anybody. He was always about love, always about equipping, always about exhortation. Well, the Apostle Paul loved the church. My God, we, I'm just going to pull it all, the, the whole the, the thing that we just, this whole uh, session that we just did for now, let's just pull it all together. When you want to talk about the true love of a father and you want to talk about uh, true love, and was Paul bitter at the church? Absolutely not. But I can show you in 1 Corinthians 5 where he told the church of Corinth, he said, when I come to you, am I going to come and bring love or am I going to bring a rod? Now that word, to everybody that don't understand what that means, when he said, I'm gonna, if I'm going to have to bring a rod, he means a rod of correction. He's going to bring correction. And 1 Corinthians 5 covers what Ryan talked about. Uh, there was sexual immorality in the church. A man was sleeping with his mother's, or his, uh, uh, he was sleeping with his mother-in-law, basically. And the word got back to him that this was going on, and there was not remorse. There was no correction being involved. There was no, there was no, nothing was being dealt with. So Paul had to address the pastor in love and gave them instructions on how to handle this. Then he gets to the end of 1 Corinthians 5, and he begins to elaborate to them, because I'm sure there was folks in that church that were saying, who are you to judge us? You're being judgmental. You're being legalistic. And then he went on to say, look, when I was with you, I told you that I'm not talking about separating yourself from the world because the world is going to be full of immorality. It's going to be full of those who are practicing sin because they're walking in darkness, because their senses have not been transformed. They're still blinded by this God of this world. He said, but I am talking about those that are on the inside, those who bear the name of Christ. He said, you're not to even eat with them. Why? Because we as as individuals, we as ministers, we as light and as salt and as a testimony to our community, a testimony to the lost, a, com a testimony to our family, we cannot blend in, look alike, look a lot, look like, sorry, got tongue tied there. We cannot blend in, uh, look just like the, the environment that we're in. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. So, uh, let me, and, uh, the, and let me talk about this spiritual fathers, true spiritual fathers invest in their sons and daughters. Um, Paul invested in the churches that he was the apostle over. He visited them when he could. Often he would visit them. He would look at the affairs of the church. He would bring correction if needed. He would financially help them. Uh, when, so what I was saying was that we have to be uh, we have to recognize that there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all these types of networks. But um, we we got to be willing to be better and recognize those things that must be um, corrected in spiritual fathers, especially because of the uh, manipulation that's going on. You know, uh, there must be an investment of time with sons and daughters. Just because you join 
a network, that should automatically make you a son or a daughter. That should uh, begin the process of being a part of something, even being affiliated with it, being uh, mentored. But you have to develop a personal relationship with that individual before you can really um, mature that and grow that into sonship. But the point of all this is that we said, you mentioned Elijah and Elisha. I think a lot of people forget about the dynamics of that relationship. First of all, when Elijah goes and throws his mantle on Elisha, uh, Elisha comes to him and says, let me follow you. And Elijah responds, what have I done unto you? You know, what a statement that he makes. What have I done unto you? You know, it wasn't like, oh, okay, you come and I'll just give you my mantle. Then there was this relationship that was cultivated over a period of time, and Elisha served Elijah. And then when eventually Elijah is going to leave and ascend to heaven, you know, the, the school of the prophets, they were mocking Elijah. <laughs> your, your spiritual father is leaving. What are you going to do now and stuff? And eventually Elijah keeps going with the, with the father. Then Elijah says something very interesting. Elijah, when he looks at Elisha and says, what would you have, what would you ask of me? And Elisha says, give me double portion. Now, that's where everybody seems to want to hang their hat. I want to connect with somebody so that I can get double portion. Now, here's the truth. Here's what Elijah said. If you see what I see, you will get double portion. So then Elijah is taken up in the whirlwind, and Elisha cries out and describes what he saw. So he saw he saw what Elijah was experiencing. So because of the relationship of time that Elisha had with Elijah, it unlocked his vision. He was able to see. And then with his vision being unlocked, it unlocked his inheritance. Now he got double portion. Now the fruit you mentioned. Elisha goes on and does twice as many miracle signs and wonders than Elijah ever did. And that's what's happening with a lot of this manipulation with sons and daughters. We're becoming sons to these quote-unquote individuals who we think we're going to garner the double. And granted, it's great. I'm not discrediting double portion. I'm not discrediting it whatsoever. However, go back and look at the Bible especially in the New Testament, and tell me how many times Elijah is mentioned and how many times Elisha is mentioned. Right. It's a huge problem. We're chasing the double portion because we don't know how to be the father. We don't know how to be the father. See, Jesus and everything that he done, he said this. This is what fascinates me. He said, if you want to see the father, you've seen him because you've seen me. Jesus also said, I don't say anything unless I first hear the Father say it. I don't do anything unless I first see the Father do it. Jesus is, is the name above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Demons flee at the name of Jesus. Yet not one single time did he ever take credit for himself. Not one single time did he ever take, you know, the identity of you got to know me. You got to know me, you know, as quote unquote son. He said in everything he did, he directed it back to the Father. He, yeah. There's no other way to the Father except through the Son. Yes, you've got to go through the Son. But everything is about the identity of the Father. I'm saying all that to say to the spiritual fathers in closing, please hear me out. If you have sons and daughters that are mimicking and modeling you, but there's no identity of the Heavenly Father, you're just mimicking and modeling man. Our purpose is to be the demonstration of the Father. Our purpose is to make sure that the Father gets all glory and all honor. Our purpose is to make sure that He is above everything. As much as we applaud mankind, man can never be greater than the Father. Do we realize that the power of Jesus, but He never said, this is all about me. He was always making sure that it went back to the Father. God, when we face God, there's, there's a, a, a deafening scripture that says that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that the Lord God will look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
it's a baffling statement when you go back to look at the scripture that says, I knew you before you were ever formed in, my, in your mother's womb. Right. How does he know you before you were formed in your mother's womb, but doesn't know you when you face him in eternity? Well, the truth is, God says, I'm looking throughout all of the earth in man in whom I can reveal myself into. Relationship. Yep. See, when you take on the identity of Christ, it's not just being Christ-like. It's about the identity of the Father. When God looks at you in eternity, he sees the blood of his Son that has covered you, but he's looking for himself in you. So I ask this of all the spiritual fathers that are out there, spiritual mothers, and everything that you're doing to equip sons and daughters. Now listen to me. Handing them a microphone and letting them have a platform moment is not the investment of their life. You need to invest into them personally. And you need to raise them up that they bear the identity of the Father. Not the identity of you. The identity of the Father. We need to get back into the demonstration of who He is. And let all things be done unto his name for his glory and his honor. Ricky, I appreciate you so, so much for allowing me to be uh, on your uh, uh, page today in Facebook Live. I don't know what's happening. Facebook cut us off multiple times. We had to come back on this one, but never I think somebody was reporting it. Somebody was telling me that somebody may have been reporting it because I noticed it ain't cutting off on yours. But yeah. On the, it's just, you know, we. It is what it is, man. But it is, but we get through, and I appreciate you did. so much. Uh, you too, brother. And uh, we'll we'll come. We got to do it again, man. Yes, Definitely. sir. And, and uh, so it's kind of weird because I'm on your page, but again, I appreciate everybody. If you're following, if you're coming back over here from the last two times we did this, uh, we appreciate you guys jumping on here today, taking your time to to give an ear and to listen. I believe people's been equipped. Uh, and edified today, uh, a lot of iron sharpening iron. So again, uh, be sure to follow Ryan uh, on your on his Facebook page. Obviously, if you're watching this, you already are. But um, on Instagram or Twitter, and in his main website as well. So um, we're gonna go, we're gonna sign out for today. Uh, but I myself will probably be back on Monday, uh, and then. Um, I don't know, uh, Ryan, or you mentioned, tell me a little bit about the, uh, the conference coming up in Pigeon Forge. Uh, yeah, we're hosting, uh, we're hosting our second, uh, conference through RJM. We actually call it prophetic cultivation. Uh, we hosted it last year in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This year we're hosting it in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee at Summit Church in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, prophetic cultivation. This year, we're concentrating on the identity of the blacksmith. Therefore, we call it Blacksmiths Arise, a gathering to be sent. Uh, we've got Lyndall Cooley coming in to minister, Jeremiah Johnson, uh, jo Joshua Gay, Jermaine Francis, Jason Armstrong, Tammy Sutherland. Uh, I'll be there, and we're trying to work on uh, one other thing, possibly, but the prophetic cultivation in the evenings are free. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, they're open to everybody. But during the daytime, we do what we call the school of advancement. As much as I love Ephesians 4, talking about five-fold ministry, I think we have abandoned the purpose of five-fold ministry, which is to equip the saints. So during the conference on Friday and Saturday, we host a school. And the school is... Uh, strictly for teaching and equipping. And we have these teachers and, and these pastors and uh, prophets and apostles. They come in and they're going to teach you. It is nine and a half hours of equipping for those sessions Friday and Saturday. And um, there's a luncheon with a Q&A on Saturday. Listen, the evening services are free. However, the school does cost $99 per person. Now, before everybody panics and goes, what are you doing charging $99 per person? Well, let's keep in mind, I've got flight tickets to pay for, lodging to pay for, food to pay for, for all these guests coming in. So the $99 for the school, what is it going to? It's not going to me. It's going towards paying for this budget. Right. These multiple flights, fuel bills for those that are driving, and so on and so forth. So I have a lot of expenses with this conference, 
Don't let the $99 scare you. If you break it down, nine and a half hours of quipping from these leaders for $99, that's not much when you break it down that way. Uh, you'll pay more to go to a movie somewhere, uh, more than likely. So it's June 13th through the 16th, June 13th through the 16th, Summit Church in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, Prophetic Cultivation. If you go to my website, you will see the link that you can link and you can register there. You need to register for the school and also for the free night so that we know that you're coming. Okay, sounds good, man. And I'm hoping I'll be able to come myself. I'm looking to come and just glean and, and get fed myself and be a part of uh, what God's going to be doing there. Um, I will also be, if you, any of you guys are watching, you're going to be in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, the end of this month, I'm going to be there for Warrior Fest 2. Um, I should be there, and if you guys see me, and if I see you, uh, I would love to uh, come up, shake your hand, get to know you a little bit better. I always try to find, you know, some of our ministry partners, whatnot, and so on and so forth. So, um, so it's been great, man. I'm going to go ahead and sign off, uh, and I know you uh, probably want to be wanting to sign off, too, after all the stuff we went through with this. Uh, but we'll be back together again. Uh, can't promise you that we won't get cut off again, but we're going to try it again later on down the road, and we'll come up with a particular topic. I'm also going to uh, have some different guests come on. This is going to be really good stuff, guys. So uh, we love you guys. We appreciate you, all of our followers, and God bless you, and we'll see you soon.